Welcome to the first Soapbox Science Sydney live online event. I'm Laura McCaukey and I'll be your host for this evening, collating questions and asking our speaker, Lara Glass, these questions during her talk. But before I give some background into Soapbox Science Sydney and introduce our speaker, I would like to acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation upon whose ancestral lands UTSC City Campus, from which we are streaming, now stands. I would also like to pay respect to the elders, both past and present, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. Soapbox Science is a platform for promoting female researchers and the research they do. Our events usually transform public areas into an arena for public learning and scientific debate, where everyone has the opportunity to enjoy, learn from, question, interact with, and be inspired by some of our leading researchers. But with COVID-19, we're turning our living rooms into these arenas. Soapbox Science ran for the first time in Sydney last year in front of the iconic Opera House in Sydney Harbour Bridge on a freezing August Saturday with over 600 attendees. Although this year's event is taking a very different format, we still want to give everyone attending the opportunity to interact with our speakers, learn more about current research and hopefully be inspired to find out more. On this note, if you have any questions for Lara during tonight's webinar, and we hope you have lots, please type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel, and we'll do our best to answer all of your questions over the next 40 minutes. You can ask questions anonymously, and also if you like a question someone else has asked and would like it answered, then please use the upvoting tool, which is the wee thumbs up symbol next to the question itself. This session will be recorded, but we will not be recording any video or audio input from the audience. If you have any concerns or questions over this, you can contact the Soapbox team via email at soapboxsciencesydney at gmail.com. Our brilliant speaker tonight, Lara Glass, has just completed a master's in neuroscience at Neuroscience Research Australia, where she worked as part of the Schizophrenia Research Lab under Professor Cindy Shannon Wecker. Lara is continuing her research at Neura studying the brains of people with and without schizophrenia that have been donated to science to try and better understand the differences between the two and ultimately come up with a cure for this crippling mental illness. I'll now hand over to Lara to hear all about her fascinating research into schizophrenia. My name is Lara and thank you so much for that introduction. As Laura mentioned, I research schizophrenia. So first of all, what is schizophrenia? So you know I'm real because I'm in front of you. You can see and hear me. If we were standing face to face, you might even be able to reach out and touch me. But what if you were the only person who could see or hear me? And what if what I was telling you was that your parents were trying to poison you? What if this started happening when you were 16 years old and it also came with an inability to concentrate, a lack of enjoyment with things that you used to enjoy and no longer wanting to interact with people? This is the reality that people with schizophrenia live with every day, and it affects one in a hundred one in a hundred Australians. So this is an illness mainly of the brain, and that is indeed directly what I research. I need to then introduce what the brain looks like, and to do that, I'm going to get a friend. This is Nelly. She is a neuron. She's made up of dendrites, a cell bo body, and axon. She is forms a connection of a network of connections of many, many neurons throughout your entire body and your brain that allow electrochemical signals to enter the dendrites, be processed in the cell body, and then passed along the axon before releasing neurotransmitters to pass on that signal to the next cell along the line. Now, these are not the only cells in your brain. You also have glue cells, known in, by their fancy Latin name, glia. These used to be thought of as the cells that literally stuck everything in your head together. But we now know that they have a lot of very important roles, including making sure that those signals transfer from one neuron to the next appropriately, and also clearing up additional dead cells or connections that don't need to be there. This is the view that most scientists have taken for many, many years as what our brain is. But for a moment, think about when you have the flu. Do you want to get out of bed? Do you want to go to work? And if you go to work, are you going to be thinking all that well? Probably not. So 
What about if you had depression? If you go to work, you're not going to be thinking of that well. You don't want to get out of bed. You don't want to see anyone. But you don't have depression if you have the flu, and the flu is definitely not depression. But they're linked from a behavioral perspective. So what's the common factor here? The blood, and more specifically, the immune system. Previously, we thought of the brain like a medieval fortress. And in order for it to communicate with the immune system at all, it needed to overcome multiple barriers. Now we know that this isn't the case, and there's an ongoing conversation between the two. So the immune system works through signaling molecules. And those signaling molecules kind of come in two flavors. One is help me, and the other one is we're good. Those help me signals actually activate immune cells, recruiting them into different tissue that requires a bit more aid. Normally, when they have an infection, we've found that those help me signals are being produced by the brain, or four in 10 people who have schizophrenia. This amazing finding led us down the next six years of research, wondering what might be going on that's different in this 40% of people with schizophrenia compared with the 60% who don't have this inflammatory immune signature, and then comparing that to people who don't have schizophrenia to understand more about the underlying cause of this illness generally and that particular group of people in particular. So my work particularly is on antibodies. Antibodies are part of your immune system and they are formed during immune responses towards invaders. Something like a bacteria or a virus gets into the body and then a small part of that is picked up by your immune system and carried along to specialized cells that train really intensely for up to two weeks to learn how to target that little part of, well, the invader. Those cells then produce antibodies that kind of have this kind of shape, a Y. Where my hands are is where they'll latch onto the invader that they've learned how to target and then mount an immune response towards whatever they've caught on to. When this goes wrong, it means that your body starts attacking yourself. And we've, we know that there are immune disorders like this, which are called autoimmune disorders, that look like schizophrenia. So my big question was, are there antibodies in the brain of people with schizophrenia? And did that 40% of people with schizophrenia with inflammation have more antibodies going on in their brain compared to everyone else? Thanks, Lara, for a fascinating introduction into your research. We've had a lot of questions come through in the Q&A um, and also from pre-registration for the event. Um, so I'll start with, firstly, can you test the blood for antibodies that cause schizophrenia? So you can and you can't. I mentioned that there were autoimmune diseases that looked like schizophrenia. With those people, we know what is causing their illness. So we can look for those particular antibodies, but we can't at the moment really look for the antibodies that I've been looking at, which I'll tell you a bit more about soon, but pretty much we don't know what they're sticking to. We don't know what they're targeting just yet. So we can find antibodies that interact with the brain, but we don't know if those are the ones that are causing someone to be sick. Really interesting. We have another question here. And it is, what is the difference between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder? So schizophrenia is, there are a fair few differences. First of all, genetically, they're a bit different. Um, you often, schizophrenia is more often found in males, so men, as opposed to females or women. And bipolar is, you more commonly find that with women. On top of that, the genetic aspect of it, the what part, what brain pathways um, that are involved, we think that cause these illnesses are different to one another. As far as I'm aware, bipolar is more, you can track it through families more easily, whereas schizophrenia, it doesn't come up quite so consistently within a family. But there are many, many discoveries to be made into both of these illnesses. And given time, we might find that they're more similar or 
considerably more different than we currently think today. That leads on to another question then. Is schizophrenia genetic? Yes and no. And that's going to be an answer for a lot of illnesses, unfortunately. Uh, if you happen to have a family member, particularly if it's your sibling or your mum or your dad who has something like schizophrenia, then you are at a greater risk for having it. But just because no one in your family has schizophrenia doesn't mean you're entirely safe. And just because someone in your family does have it doesn't mean you're definitely going to get it. Instead, it just means you need to potentially be a bit more careful uh, than everyone else when it comes to things like managing your stress, because that is something that can contribute to the foundational steps towards developing schizophrenia. We've got a question here from Cassandra. She says, great talk, Clara. Um, could neuroplasticity be relevant and helpful in curing schizophrenia? You might want to see what neuroplasticity is first. I'm not sure. Fair enough. So neuroplasticity is pretty much the art of changing your brain by your brain. Your brain is somewhat hardwired with some parts of your brain connecting with other particular parts, but it's not set in stone. And you are consistently creating new pathways, new super highways to allow a more streamlined I guess, user experience of your own mind. This is kind of the way that when you first started trying to write, your handwriting wasn't great, but over time, your handwriting became more and more fluid. Now that you type more, well, your handwriting might have gone a bit backwards. This is neuroplasticity at work. When you start off, you're learning a new skill, so your hand is going to be a bit more fumbly, and that neural pathway isn't as strong. By the point in time, say you're in high school, your handwriting is going to be pretty great and nice and fast. As you type more, you're beginning to lose that ability because you're not using it so much. But your typing speed is going to increase because that particular pathway is now, well, it's more used. It's become more streamlined. So when it comes to something like schizophrenia, there are ideas that you do have inappropriate neuroplasticity connections that are there that shouldn't be, connections that aren't maintained when they should be. However, that research needs an awful lot more work. It's not specifically my field, but it does have a lot to do with schizophrenia. It also has a lot to do with illnesses like autism and bipolar and ADHD and many other mental illnesses because the way our neural plasticity or the ability for our brains to change the way that allows us to think is one of the foundational ways that we're able to communicate and interact with the world. And mental illness, one aspect of it is that it removes our ability to do that in what is considered a normal fashion. We've got two questions now relating to antibodies. Um, the first is, are antibodies involved in other mental illnesses? Oh, I like that one. So. Yes, maybe, no, don't know. And the reason why I'm saying yes, maybe, no, don't know is because this research is quite new. A lot of people haven't really looked into antibodies in the brain, partially because, well, it was previously thought they couldn't get in. The brain is that nice fortress and an antibody is quite a large molecule. So most people have kind of gone, that only happens if you've got a crazy infection. Why would we look? Why would we look? Well, people like me are willing to give it a go. That's why. So they might be there. They might have a big role. But I'm hoping I get to, or maybe someone else will in the future, investigate that further. That's really interesting. I love when you have a finding and then you can apply it to so much other research. Oh, um, the other question about antibodies was... Um, from an anonymous person, they said, I was under the impression that antibodies are generally not found in the brain. Are there any known differences in the blood-brain barrier in schizophrenia patients? So the blood-brain barrier is literally that dividing structure that I mentioned very briefly earlier that prevents parts of your immune system through your blood entering the brain um, and vice versa somewhat. So there is 
some evidence saying that the blood-brain barrier isn't working properly in people with schizophrenia. However, there's also evidence to say that the blood-brain barrier is A-OK, -okay, and people who are turning around saying that it's not working as it should, well, they're entirely wrong. So it depends on who you ask. However, the blood-brain barrier is not permanently one way or the other. It does, the ability for things to move across it can change with things like stress or when you have infections. So it's possible that you've got something that's opportunistic that kind of sneaks in when some, for example, if you've got a really bad cold, you might end up with just the right amount of Im immune signaling molecules, help me signals, allowing that blood-brain barrier to end up a bit more leaky than it would otherwise be. This lets, potentially could let in antibodies or even whole immune cells to then wreak havoc and cause a lot of damage inside the brain itself. So yes and no, if that helps. <laughs> that sounds like most research, yes and no. And we need to do some more research to find out the answer. Um, we've got more questions, but in terms of time, I want to hear more about your research. So I'll hand back over to you and we'll have some more questions in a few minutes. So antibodies. We now know that ant what antibodies kind of look like, and we know that I've been looking at them in schizophrenia. But how was I looking at them? So I was lucky enough to look at the, have been lucky enough to work with the brains that people have donated to science after they die. I've gotten very, very little slices of them and pretty much built like a molecular lighthouse on top. Every time there was an antibody that was in the brain, this lighthouse would be built and then I was able to turn that light on. This way, I was able to, I was trying to find what these antibodies were necessarily targeting or sticking to in the brain. I was expecting to find cells like Nelly had antibodies in them and I didn't. Instead, I found blood vessels surrounded by a halo of antibodies. This was so surprising that I thought what I did was wrong. So I repeated the experiment in monkeys. Monkeys ranging from babies all the way through to adults, and we saw the same thing. Then I went, oh, maybe, maybe it's the amount of antibodies. Maybe people with schizophrenia have more antibodies than people who don't have schizophrenia. So I went back to the brain and measured the number of antibodies. And again, people with schizophrenia had the same amount of antibodies as people who didn't have schizophrenia when they're alive. On top of that, people who had schizophrenia and had this inflammatory signature, well, they also had the same amount of antibodies. But I'm a bit of an optimist, so I went, cool, we've got antibodies there, that's great, but antibodies work by interacting with receptors. As I said, they look a bit like a Y. My hands is where they grab onto their target and my elbows is their tail. And this tail interacts like a key into a lock to a receptor that triggers immune responses. So it will activate an immune cell. There's one particular receptor though, that's a transporter. It grabs hold of the antibody from one side of a cell and moves it over to the other. I went, maybe, we already know these are in the brain. So maybe the amount of those transporters is different in the brains of people with schizophrenia. And I found no difference. None at all. Everyone had the same amount and I wasn't giving up yet. So far, I only looked into one area of the brain, kind of around about here. It's called your prefrontal cortex and it helps you think about the world and also controls your impulses. I shifted my focus to another area of the brain. This area of the brain is called the midbrain. It's, you most likely know it because it's the brain, part of the brain that has dopamine neurons. These are very, very important in controlling your movement, but are also involved in processing information. So looking at these, this particular brain area, we already knew from recent work done by my lab that, you know, that inflammation I mentioned before? Well, we found it in the prefrontal cortex, but in 40% of people with schizophrenia, the inflammation in their midbrain, it was off the charts. So if we're going to find a difference in antibodies, it would be here. I do my experiments all over again. I'm looking for my antibodies and I found them. Great. I see my halo surrounding my blood vessels. 
And then I saw these little cells. They were kind of round, and I had no idea what they were. And all I could think of was, hey, little guys, you look a little bit like those glue cells. Are you glue cells? Unfortunately, they didn't talk back to me, which might be a good thing, but I could turn around and go, there are other receptors in the brain that interact with antibodies. There are help me receptors and we're good receptors. One of those help me receptors acts as a seesaw with the we're good receptor. And these receptors are actually involved in an autoimmune disorder, disorder called lupus. And there is a particular idea about lupus that it's the, inner, the lack of a balance between those two receptors that can allow that illness to continue. So I went, right, let's look at these two receptors. Do I have too much or too little of either of them? Well, not me. I mean, people with schizophrenia in their midbrain, is there too much or too little of these receptors? So instead of looking at the protein, I actually looked at an intermediary step between your gene and a protein. And this is called mRNA. It's kind of like your middle management. It gives you an idea of what's actually going on in the company that is your cell without you having to count every single protein. But it's not so much of an overhead like the CEO where you just get vague ideas without really boots on the ground knowledge. It gives you an idea of how much of something is being used, how much of it's being made and ready to go. So looking at the mRNA of, the, of these two receptors, I was able to find out that the help me signaling receptor wasn't just increased in people with schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia with that inflammatory signature, again, off the charts. Literally, I could barely make a graph of it. It was so high. On the other hand, that we're good signaling receptor, it wasn't changed at all. So you've got, if you had schizophrenia and you have that inflammatory signature sitting in your midbrain, you've got no way to hold down and stop that inflammatory process going on triggered by antibodies. And that's being allowed to continue by that help me signaling receptor. And I went, ah, what about the transporters? We, I've forgotten about them. Let's look at them again. And we found more transporters in these people too. So let's put it all together. If you are a human or a monkey, you have antibodies in your brain. But if you happen to have schizophrenia and you have the inflammatory biotype or the inflammatory signature in your midbrain, you're going to have an increased amount of antibody help me signaling receptors there. And you're going to have an increased amount of those antibody transporter. What does this necessarily mean? Well, it might be an increased ability for your brain to interact with these antibodies. Or, and that might, as a result, contribute to schizophrenia because you, need, you don't have the way to stop it from occurring. Another possibility is that it's involving those tiny little cells I found, because those tiny little cells, which I thought looked a little bit like glial cells, well, they could also be another cell that we found previously in the brain of people with schizophrenia. These are the eat me cells or macrophages, literally meaning big eater. When they find an invading cell, or some, a cell that's been damaged, they literally come along and eat it, kind of like Pac-Man. When this happens though, and it, they've eaten the wrong thing, it can do things like seriously damage your brain, removing connections that should be there. So this is another line where we, should, we need more research, more studies, because maybe if we can control this inappropriate eating, we might be able to help people with schizophrenia regain different aspects of their lives that have been stolen by this illness. I could keep going on for a while, but I'm sure there might be a few questions. Thanks, Lara. I love that your hypothesis was completely wrong, because that is, again, <laughs> what research is really like. Um, we do have a few questions coming in. Um, the first one is from, I think, from the first part of your talk. Um, mm -hmm. So based on what you said, does it mean that someone may be predisposed to schizophrenia, but it takes stressors or triggers to bring about its manifestation? 
I'm wondering if this person's a researcher because that's 100% correct. Um, that is indeed what the current idea is. But what that predisposition, what that vulnerability looks like, still yet to be really determined. And it could be many things. The idea that schizophrenia is one illness is more like we're trying to describe a bunch of symptoms, assuming that they're all going to be the same, have the same cause, but that's not necessarily true. So we think there are vulnerabilities, we're just not sure which ones lead to what and what those vulnerabilities mean at a molecular level or even necessarily look like at a molecular level. So we need to do more research to find the answers. <laughs> Pretty much. And whoever asked that question, um, I think you have a future in this, it seems. You can write your next grant with them. Um, <laughs> so you talked a lot about midbrain inflammation. Does this occur in all people with schizophrenia? And if not, what might cause the differences? That is a fantastic question. Um, it only occurs in four out of 10 people with schizophrenia. So this is actually something that's been found by many, many, not many, many, I'd say quite a few research labs now. They found this in different brain areas. They've even also found it in the blood of people living with schizophrenia. Somewhere between as low as about 30 and as high as 50% of people have this inflammatory signature or also known as the inflammatory biotype. But what that necessarily looks like and how to detect it can change. In particular, which help me signaling molecules are we're using to define it can be different. So it's less a matter of this all looks like the exact same and more a matter of this might have the same result. But again, more research needs to be done on that front. Standard. So this question is a bit more left field. How mm -hmm. do you donate your brain to science? How do I donate my brain to science? Well, the first thing you need to do is have a brain. Check. Second thing you need to do is probably either talk to your doctor or get in touch with people at the New South Wales Brain Bank. The Brain Bank happens to be housed at Neuroscience Research Australia. The people there are really friendly and they can tell you far more about it than I can about that process. However, there are some things that might mean you can't donate your brain. It might be things like you have a family history of certain illnesses, you've had a lot of concussions, or you, know, you might have had a stroke. But that doesn't necessarily mean you can't donate your brain to science at all. It just means you can't donate your brain to science across the board. Instead, it's a good idea to try and find a particular illness that they need more brains in the future and that for future studies. And that way you can help that illness in particular or that condition in particular, because you are what will be called a case. You happen to have this condition or have that illness that they want to study. This means that once you then approach them, they'll give you a bunch of paperwork that means that once you've passed away, the people who actually collect the brains will be alerted and they'll come along and respective respectfully remove your brain and carefully keep it at negative 80 degrees Celsius to preserve it and subsequently do experiments on it to better understand your brain, brains in general, and how to hopefully cure various illnesses and conditions. That's really interesting. We all know about organ donors, but I guess you don't really hear that much about donating your brain. Um, We've still got more questions, but in terms of time, I want to hear a wee bit more about your research and then we'll wrap up with some questions at the end. So back over to you, Lara. The next part about my research is me just kind of talking about crazy ideas. So strap in for a bit of a wild ride. Right. We know so far schizophrenia is in your brain. Yep. Cool. We also know that we've got inflammation involved in the, in the brain of people with schizophrenia. And I quickly mentioned that there was inflammation in the blood. So let's hone in on that a bit more. Looking at the inflammation of people with schizophrenia in the blood itself is a very difficult task. And there are some people who've actually been able to do something that as far as I'm aware in Australia, we're yet to be able to do. We know that there's a conversation happening between the brain and the blood, but the brain doesn't necessarily have great access to the blood. It does have access to something called the cerebral spinal fluid. This is circulating throughout your nervous system. And there are some people all over the world, 
in uh, America and various other places all over the world who have access to brain, blood, and cerebral spinal fluid from a particular person. This means that they can directly compare the immune system in all three parts of the body that are affected in autoimmune diseases like multiple sclerosis, or in this instance, like schizophrenia. I hope one day we might be able to compare all three parts of the body to better understand how antibodies and how the immune system is communicating with our brain and what that really means for mental illness. Another fun thing that I touched on was cells. So those receptors I talked about, the help me receptors and the we're good receptors are found on many different cell types, some of which we don't necessarily even think of as immune cells. In fact, there's recent research that has found these receptors might even be on neurons like Nelly. I found those tiny little cells, right? Well, we don't know what they are yet. Many options, there are many, many options. One of them could be those eat me cells I spoke about quickly. Those eat me cells inside the blood are, have multiple names, but there's something that looks very similar to an eat me cell within the brain and that's called microglia. My lab has already found microglia that have been activated. So they look all angry and they're planning, ready and rearing to go to mediate an immune response in the brain of people with schizophrenia. On the flip side, we've also found eat me cells in the brain of people with schizophrenia too, but that's more in the cortex, not in the midbrain. Next steps for that kind of research is to look into whether or not those eat me cells, both in the cortex, are even in the midbrain, and if they have those receptors there that are being that are being activated directly, that are activating them via antibodies. And the, ni the next thing was touched on by someone when they asked, what are those antibodies interacting with? Can we detect them in the blood? Well, I might have been a bit sneaky in my answer because yes, we can detect them in the blood across the board, sort of. One of my experiments was taking the blood of people with schizophrenia and applying it to little pieces of monkey brain. This was pretty much being used as a surrogate for human brain. Doing it this way meant I could see, I was asking the question, are there antibodies in the blood that directly interact with proteins found in the brain? What we found was yes. But this is where things got weird again, because instead of finding people with schizophrenia with more antibodies that targeted things, proteins within the brain, we actually found people with schizophrenia had less. But an antibody is meant to increase inflammation. Yes, that is true. But there's a tiny little bit of corner of research deep in amongst all the great crazy papers that say that some antibodies can are really, really good for you and they help to restore a balance in your body, to prevent your immune system from growing a bit crazy. So is it possible that the antibodies that we found in the brain, are maybe they're those restorative antibodies, the ones that keep everything on an even keel, and maybe it's the absence of them that's contributing to schizophrenia? We don't know yet, but that's another step in another direction that hopefully I might be able to take one day. The other one and final one that I want to quickly touch on is autoimmune diseases. So autoimmune diseases are illnesses in which the body is attacking itself via, normally via antibodies. However, at this point in time, there is a very big push to try and find autoimmune diseases that look like schizophrenia caused by a single antibody. This is something that's really, really great because if we are able to find an autoimmune disease caused by a single kind of antibody, we've got a very cool mechanism that we might be able to use called our immune systems to deliver drugs to destroy those disease-causing antibodies. Us as scientists have ways to hijack the immune system and act almost like a piggyback 
to grab onto what would be medications. And now these days actually transfer them into the brain and into the immune system itself, into the brain itself to then actually reduce inflammation and counteract those damaging effects. However, we need to know what to target first. In the case of my research, we don't yet know what to target. And so that's the next, another step that needs to be taken, working out what those antibodies are interacting with. And if they happen to be the kind of antibodies that cause an autoimmune response, how do we actually hijack our immune systems to then deliver drugs to prevent them from doing that? So, unless we want more crazy hypotheses, do we have time for more questions? I love that you went down the crazy hypothesis route because that's the really fun part about science is thinking up all these crazy ideas and then going out and finding out if they're true or not. Um, so thanks for that. That was really inspiring. We do have more questions. Um, I'll start with, do the eat me cells mm -hmm. contribute to the inflammation in the brain? Ooh, maybe. The reason why I'm saying maybe is because they are traditionally thought of as pretty much just eating things. They don't necessarily produce a lot of their own immune signaling molecules, at least not in the way most people think of them. They are able to produce them, but it's not their primary function. It's possible that they do do that, but I'm not sure if anyone's really looking into it. Another piece of research for someone to do. Definitely. Um, so another question is, are brain cells actually dying in schizophrenia or are they just changing? Ooh, I keep saying ooh a lot. I'm sorry. These are great questions. I like it. Not exactly. Schizophrenia is, like many other mental illnesses, it's one of those situations in which a person is, who they are is shielded by an illness. While they're not dying, who they were may be gone for good. And who they are today is often hidden behind the reality of that illness. So while a person with schizophrenia may not have their brain degenerating, say, similar to something with like Alzheimer's, it's not working the way that it should work. The number of cells themselves might not change, but the way that the brain is connecting to itself might be. So it could be not necessarily cell death, but poor rewiring is a be might be a better way of putting it. Again, we don't know. And because we define schizophrenia by a nice big clump of symptoms as opposed to one particular chemical cause, we might be missing people who actually are experiencing cell death because we're too busy looking at lumping them all in with all the people who aren't. So as far as I know, no, but that doesn't mean that that doesn't happen. This question is a bit left field. Why does marijuana cause schizophrenia or does it not? It, it doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> as with every bit in research. So marijuana is, I'm, I'm sure most people know it gets you high, but some people happen to have a genetic mutation where if they do smoke marijuana or consume it, it can pretty much trigger schizophrenia. This is only in the people who have this mutation and it isn't a guaranteed sure thing that they're going to get it if they happen to smoke a joint once. It's something where they're more at risk, they're vulnerable. And that, again, means that they need to be more careful. But it's not something that most people are going to go, hey, I'm going to get a genetic test done to see whether or not it's okay for me to go and smoke a joint. However, it's one of the reasons why everyone should be very, very careful when it comes to things like recreational drug use, because you don't know the effect it's going to have on your body. You might happen to be one of those people who has this vulnerability. And then once you find out, it might be too late to do anything about it. So if you don't have this vulnerability, you might be fine. If you do, well, maybe think about having a glass of wine instead. 
<laughs> yeah, I think I'll stick to the wine. Um, hypothetically, how do you think your research could aid treatment of schizophrenia? So, we have many ways to actually use our immune system as it is. We use it to treat cancer, we use it to treat arthritis, we use it to treat lupus, even eczema these days. We have special antibodies that we manufacture and then inject into people that can not necessarily cure people of these different illnesses, but instead of trying to put a Band-Aid on them, the way a lot of medications do for chronic illness, they try and treat the cause. What I'm looking at is still a bit too young to know whether or not we can cure schizophrenia with it. But purely because I don't want to get everyone's hopes up saying we have a cure. But for those people who do have this inflammatory signature and who do have those little cells I spoke about, it's quite possible that for them using at the very least, we can harness our immune system to Reg better regulate or restore balance back to their immune systems using things like antibodies. Because we already know that antibodies can get into the brain, this means we could use an antibody to piggyback medications into the brain too. It's not necessarily an easy thing to do because as I mentioned, it has to be small enough to fit into the brain and get past that barrier. But we have evidence that it's possible. This is one of the ways that people are looking at treating multiple sclerosis, which is an illness where pretty much this part of brains, the axon, is getting destroyed. The axon has a bunch of insulation around it, and in multiple sclerosis, it's thought that an immune process is ruining, is destroying that. Using sort, these sorts of immune-driven medications or therapies, as they're known as, you can directly prevent that process from happening. So it, for us to actually use the immune system that way to cure schizophrenia, we first need to know what's going wrong and what those, how the immune system is causing this illness or playing a role in it. But it's definitely possible. And antibodies are a great way of actually delivering those medications to the brain. How fabulous will it be on the day that you actually see your research used to treat an illness? Like it really will be a celebration. Oh yes, that would be phenomenal. So we've got time for one last question and a really quick few word answer, but it's an important question. Mm -hmm. Why did you get into research in the first place? Well, I didn't want to be a scientist growing up. I wanted to be like an historian or an artist, but I'm from a medical family and seeing them help people was something that I found so amazing and magical. On top of that, the more, as I got older, I was, I interacted more and more with people with mental illness. And that meant that I felt that this wasn't something I wanted to leave alone. I wanted to know why it happened. I wanted to know how it happened. And I wanted to be able to not solve that problem, but help them live their best lives with whatever illness that happened to be. And I ended up falling into neuroscience. I fell in love with the chemistry on the chemistry of it and I came across an amazing mentor who was unbelievably inspiring who took me under her wing and let me enter a wonderful lab and go on this amazing journey which means now I'm very excited about the immune system as well as brains but that's what science is it's curiosity it's inspiration and at least from my perspective it's also an awful lot of creativity that's a lovely answer it's I think it's what most researchers say is they get into research because they really want to help people. Well, thank you for a brilliant talk today, Lara, and thank you to everyone who attended and asked questions. If you want to watch this talk again, then, or if you know someone who's missed it and who would enjoy it, then we'll be posting it on our website um, in the next coming weeks. You'll also receive a post-event email in the next 24 hours with an evaluation survey. Please fill this out as it helps us to gauge the success of our events and make improvements for next year. We couldn't run Soapbox Science without our sponsors, so I'd like to give a big thank you to the University of Technology Sydney, Excite on Science, Equus, and the University of Wollongong for their continued support. We have so many more great talks lined up, 
over the next three nights, starting with Nisha Duggan in 15 minutes, talking about how flies and spiders could help us cure stroke. You can join all of these talks from the link here now on, or you can find more information on our website, soapboxsciencesydney.com. Thank you again for attending, and we hope to see you at our next talk.